prayer ministry of, of the Bible, the prayer ministry of Jesus. Um, someone called the Gospel of John the mountain range of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that a good description. Depending on what book I'm reading, <laughs> it's my favorite book. When people say, what's your favorite book? But well, it's usually the one I'm reading then. But the Gospel of John would have to be awfully close to the top at any time. My, my favorite books are probably Hebrews, Ephesians, and John. And I'd hate to have to choose. Romans, of course, come in there theologically. Now, think of this. If, if the Gospel of John is the mountain range of the Bible, then John 17 is the Mount Everest. This is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. And literally, you can, you can lay the tabernacle down or lay the Gospel of John down beside the tabernacle and you can see clearly the outline of the Gospel of John in the compartments of the tabernacle. The outer court, the holy place, and here's where the veil parts and you go into the Holy of Holies, including the cross, which is where the blood was put on the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. And, uh, and this is the Mount Everest. Now, how many of you guys have read uh, Pilgrim's Progress? How many of you have read it to remember it? Do you remember it pretty good? Well, do yourself a favor. If you haven't read it, make it project number one. It's, it's the best source of illustrations I've ever seen outside the Bible. And the illustration is normal, and I don't, I don't think you're going to take this seriously. In fact, I don't think you take much of this seriously. I really don't. I, I, think, I think sometimes we just let these things slide by and show our interest, and that doesn't mean I'm not happy that you're here. The one thing I would want to ask is the question this chapter will ask. Where are your disciples? You may have them. I hope you do. And I hope you have a mass number behind you. But that's the acid test. That's the test he will ask me. It's the test he will ask you. But in Pilgrim's Progress, you may recall that it looked a little like this. It was this erratic. He ran into one massive challenge after another. And he was often traveling with a companion, faithful or another. And sometimes as a bad companion. He didn't know it at the moment when he identified with him, and that companion sloughed away and would turn back to the city of destruction, like pliable. And, and so they arrive, they're, they're, they're going along here, and they've already come. They come from the city of destruction, and they're headed for the city of God, or the city of light, or the city of gold, but they don't know how far away it is, and they don't know how far they've come. They know they've come a long way, but they don't know how much further they have to go. And they're very easily discouraged because of the heavy terrain and the battles they're having to fight and the temptations they're facing and every time they turn around it's a new thing it's a melodrama crescendo of test after test after test and, and at this point in the book they meet a group of shepherds who take them up on a mountain here's an interesting thing it's called mount perspective Very interesting. And from Mount Perspective, they're able to look back over the territory they've already traversed so they can see how far they've come. And then they're able to look forward to where they're going. They do not see the river, but they do see the spires of the city of gold. And it's much closer here than it is back here. So they've come a great portion of their journey. They've got some hard territory yet to go, but it's now in sight, and they're very much encouraged by what they see. Now, this is precisely what John 17 is. It's the highest mount perspective in the Bible. And you can learn more about more things in John 17 than probably <clears throat> any other chapter in the Bible. See, this one's not confined to just one thing. For example, Jesus looks all the way back here. He talks about the glory I had with you before the world was. So he looks all the way back. 
And at the end, he says, I want them to be with me in the glory I had with you before the world was. So I want you to restore the glory to me, and I want you to include them in it. So he looks all the way forward, and right in the middle, there's another mountain he focuses on, Mount Calvary, in this prayer. And he doesn't overtly say it, obviously, but it's very conspicuously there. So this is an incredible perspective chapter looking backwards and forward and also looking at the present moment. Now, another feature is the word pray, I pray, second, it's first person singular, is used four times in this passage. I pray. It's used twice in one verse and one in two, once each in two other verses. Those verses are verse 9, it's used twice, verse 15, and verse 20. I pray. Now, here's an interesting feature. This is not the usual word for pray. This word would not, you, you could not use this for your prayers. Nor will God use it for your prayers. Nor will anybody legitimately use it for your prayers. Because this is the distinctive word that means an, an appeal that passes between equals. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting word. I mean, this is one gigantic passage. An appeal that passes between equals. Now, that could never be said about your prayer. You have equal position by conferred grace, but you are not equal to God. So this word could never be used for your prayers legitimately. But it's used by Jesus four times here when he talks to the Father, and it's one of those subtle statements that he and God are co-equals, and have always been co-equals. He and the Father are co-equals. So there's a, another thing. Now, let me outline the passage, and I, I don't want to get very far tonight. I, I, I want to hit two or three high ideas, and then we'll come back and look at the real substance of the prayer next time. This is one of those highly systematized passages. The first five verses obviously form one unit, and it's, it'd be almost impossible to miss it if you're thinking when you read. Verses 6 to 19 form a second unit, and again it'd be impossible to miss it if you're thinking. And then verses 20 through, actually it's 23, the chapter doesn't end until 26, but the last three verses, 24 through 26, are kind of capsule with him primarily looking forward to the end. The substance of the prayer appeal itself, as far as the organization of it, ends with verse 23. But the capsule form, and there's a gigantic appeal, to actually two appeals in verses 24 through 26. And very simply, in the first five verses, Jesus prays for himself. And he has two essential requests. One of them has to do with the immediate present and another has to do with the future. And then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for his immediate 12, and I'm going to go ahead and call them this anyway, they're apostolic disciples. Remember, out of the disciples, he chose 12, 12 whom he also called apostles. So I'll call them apostolic disciples. And I, I say that advisedly because that's one of the big points of this prayer. <clears throat> um, I want somebody to volunteer for next time to count and, and document the occurrence of the word sent in this prayer. Just find out, count how many times it occurs. Well, everybody do it. Let's make that assignment. Count how many times it occurs and notice the verses it's in, the word sent is in, and what's your most impressive verse in which it's used? So take that on as a sign for next time. We'll let somebody do it next time. Brother Herb, yeah. when you say 12, I know. No. Yeah, 11. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 12 is a, num is a title. Okay. Like uh, Paul used the word 12 when there weren't but 10 there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It's a title, so I would say capital T12, but that's a good question, a good point. He makes an exception in verse 12. Yeah, 
not the son of perdition. Don't yeah. pray for him. Yeah. Uh, everybody, everybody you gave me is kept. Uh, the one whom he said had a devil from the beginning was never saved, so it couldn't be kept. Okay. In verses 20 through 23, and here's where you and it, he prays for us as certainly as if he called our name. Mm -hmm. All future disciples who will emerge because of the ministries of the twelve. And that's all disciples to the end of history. So in these verses, I mean, this prayer covers everything. And, and there, are, there are a lot of warrants here, and there are a lot of, in effect, it's an echo, a practical echo of his commands about making disciples. Because when you get down to the, even the statistics of this prayer, they are staggering. But this is a world in itself. Himself, his immediate 12. So what Jesus is doing here, he's drawing concentric circles. Himself, the twelve, and again a title, eleven, and then all future. And notice that the ministry goes exactly like this. It goes from him out through them. In other words, he stops if they fail. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. It goes from him out through them. So his ministry stops if they fail. This is the way he has chosen it. This is the way he has designed it. The same thing is true of you. You are responsible to occupy this part of the concentric circle. And he stops and you stop. See, disciple making means that Herb Hodge's life does not end at Herb Hodge's death. See, because the invested person then reproduces. In other words, my life should not only go on, it should multiply in an ever-widening way when I die, but it'll only do that if I follow the strategy of Jesus. And then through them, so you see, it's always the vehicle of the incarnationally built or the built incarnational person. And it starts with the incarnation, capital I, then there's to re be a reproduction of the same incarnation truth-wise and life-wise. In other words, the very life of Christ is to monopolize these people and His truth is to pass through them and without the truth there's no salvation for these people in the future. So there has to be a Bible that is spirit-oriented in this person and a spirit that is Bible-related in this person. So Jesus' task was to have get them filled with the Spirit based on Scripture and scripture interpreted through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so he built people like this and then turned them loose in the world. And we're here tonight because of some measure of success through some succession in history because of the way he trained those 11 people. So this is ultimately big. There are three aspects here. So let's mark down the advised part of it. Here we see the individual feature of prayer. It is legitimate to pray for yourself. Here, here we see, although it ought not to be dominant, unless there's some really particular point of need. In other words, your focus should not be on yourself. And yet you, you're perfectly warranted to pray for yourself. And then here's the intercessory factor of his prayers. Boy, here's where the real glory of the Christian life, there's nothing else like this on earth. That we are invited to live by, for, into, and through other people. We're mandated, we're not just invited. And here it really better breaks into full, full force. And then here, here is the indefinite future of his prayers because of the second one. Everything depends on what happens in the immediate with the disciples that are built. And if the disciples are properly built in the immediate, then the indefinite future is guaranteed. 
God will take care of that. But everything depends on what we do with the disciple that is in front of us at the moment. This is gigantic. Now, let's let's uh, look at the first little part of it. And we've already said enough. <laughs> first tiny part of it. Let's look at the first five verses. And and I'm, I'm going to deliberately leave out a poor part of it that will look maybe like the most significant part of it. Now, the first commanding thing when you glance at the first five verses is the recurrence of some form, either the original root form or a variant of the word glory. And immediately that raises a lot of questions. What does the word mean? Well, biblically, this is the word that is used for the exhibit of the character of God or the display of the nature of God, the display of the character of God. See, when, when it says all have sinned and come short, means if you're less perfect than God is, you, you qualify as a sinner. Falling short of the glory or the nature, the character of God. And Colossians 1.27 says, since Adam sinned and lost the glory, Christ in you is the hope of glory. In other words, the only way to get back the nature of God that was lost God departed out of Adam when he sinned. Only way to get it back is through Christ in you. So once Christ is in you, he's in there to make your life, wow, a displayed case for the glory of God or the character of God. That's Amen. what we Christians are all about, to conform you to the image of Christ so that he can be on exhibit again. And you can be transformed into that image. So this is gigantic word, but now... Here, the variant forms really turn on some lights. If you look at them, the first one is in verse 1. It's the word glorify. The second one is in verse 4. I have glorified. Now, let me go ahead and fill out a little substance in verse 1. Glorify thy Son. And I have glorified, in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. And here is a challenging sentence. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. In verse 5, here's the word glorify again. And now, O Father, glorify thou me. So these, the, they're, this, these appeals, they're a bracket and then a middle appeal. Or a middle statement. There's a bracket of appeals and a middle statement. Uh, verse 5 says, Now, O Father, glorify thou me. Well, there are somebody's traveling close together Father and the Son now what's the frame of reference here what, what is this about this one concerns the immediate present when Jesus is praying concerns the very time when he's praying see he's on the eve of Calvary now what precedes this request? What comes just before it? The hour has come. The hour has come. So you know this is the this is immediate. Everything in the Gospel of John has been postponing and looking forward to quote the hour, the time. He said, the hour is not yet. My time has not yet come. And then he said, now is the prince of this world judged. The hour has come. And here, it, there, he's under the shadow of it now. 
So this is an appeal that God will wrap him in his manifest nature on the cross. The hour has come. In other words, let people see you through the cross. And there is nothing in history that ever demonstrated the glory of God like the death of Jesus on the cross. So he is appealing that God will show himself through what happens the hour is the package hour of the redeeming events, the death, resurrection, the events around it. In other words, the last week and subsequent, immediate subsequent things, that's the hour he's talking about. And all of eternity has focused in on that hour. Now he appeals that the Father will demonstrate himself through this. Notice what he did not pray. He did not pray, deliver your son. He did not pray anything like pamper your son. He prayed, he prayed glorifying your son and here's the reason watch it carefully that your son also, also may glorify you so through it all let people see you that's what he's asking for now look at the second one this is in verse 4 what tense is this <clears throat> Pass. In, in Greek it's not well, there is no it have to be a different statement, but in English it's, it's past tense. Now, what does he mean here? I have glorified thee on the earth. And then he says, I have, past tense, finished. Now, most commentators say this still refers to the cross. That can't be. He fulfilled the training of Old Testament. No. You, you, that's one. See, he came for several purposes. He came to reveal God. Had he done it? Yes. Yes. He came to redeem men. Had he done that? No. Yeah. No. Had been to the cross yet? So this is. This is in the immediate future, but that's not what he's talking about here. And he came, say it again. All right, he came to reproduce by means of multiplication in the training of the twelve. And, and so Jesus came for two primary purposes. To redeem men while revealing God, or to reveal God while redeeming men, and to reproduce by the training of a small number of men and set them in motion and multiplication. Now, both of these, this one is not done yet. This one is done to the degree to where he is now, and this one is completed. He's not going to add anything else to the, to the training process. The training process is over. Everything now is adding the thrust for the movement, the day of Pentecost coming of the Holy Spirit, the logistical things are necessary, but the training process is over. So Jesus has completed the two essential things he came to do, except for the one that is still in the immediate present in front of him as a part of the package deal. So this one hasn't been done yet, but these have been done, and yet the greatest revelation of God is going to come on the cross. But he personally has revealed God. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then this process is over. So Jesus is saying here in verse 4, I've, I've shown you to men and I've accomplished the work. Now, see, a lot of people have a lot of questions about what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. I have a question. Okay. What about Paul? What about Paul? If, if the production... The training process of the, of the disciples Paul, is over. Of the disciples. But That's all he's Paul. talking about here. Oh, okay. But Up Paul, to verse 19. Okay. Then he talks about Paul would fall into verse 20 and fall. Okay. Or you and I would fall. Okay. So, but you're right. Keep thinking. I appreciate that. Nail me when you can. <laughs> really, honestly. I because, I yeah, well, honestly. And he, I mean, he did some encouraging after his resurrection. Oh, he, he did a lot of things. In fact, Peter didn't even see the world, world impact I did until Acts 10. But the training process itself is over. Mm -hmm. Now the rest of it is enforcing it. And uh, 
they're still arguing at the end, but the training process is over. He's not going to add anything to that process anymore. It's completed. And the reason, the, the primary reason I believe this is the preponderance of what's mentioned in this prayer. I'll show it to you. Well, let me show it to you now. We've said it before, but I, it's just hard for this to register. In 23 verses, this prayer, Jesus mentions his disciples by designation. And he actually refers to them 46 times. Now, one wonders what we're thinking as Christians when we always think of something else in the matter of being a Christian. May I tell you something? God will have exactly the amount of respect for your prayers that you have in sounding like this when you pray. No more. In other words, He is really serious about this thing about you making disciples. And he modeled it perfectly and mandated it, set it in motion. He's serious about it. The problem is we're always doing something else. We're always thinking in other directions, postponing, always going to do something. Why? See, why not today? Why not now? Where's your disciple now? And what is he doing now? And, and, and why not if he's not? And, and certainly, I would hope for everybody he is, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm new enough to look around me and see it's not taking place. In other words, we have, we have subtly displaced the standard of Jesus with a thousand other concepts. Here it is, big as life. In other words, when he is on final review before his Father, this is what his ministry is about. When he is exposing everything from eternity to eternity about himself, it all focuses on this right here. And he mentions those men coupled with the future, and the future he doesn't, this occurrence is predominantly, verses 6 through 19, the predominance of the prayer is about the immediate 11. And therefore, most of these mentions concern them. Just like most of your mentions, I mean, in the last few days, Every, every minute my mind has had any vagrancy about it at all it's turned to Guyana to pray for those guys down there. And I get the email today that Casey Pearson got sick before he left home. There was a bug in their family and he vomited four times on the plane between <laughs> Miami. And don't, don't you know he had an income but this is one prince of a guy I'm telling you. And this is his first trip and he has the assignment to speak six times this trip and he will do one bang up job and I can hardly wait just for I know how Dan will do I know how Dylan will do and because I know Dan and Dylan I know how Gabe Englehart will do Casey's the one I want to hear from and he's the one who's ramrodding all of this movement at Kirby Woods has brought those hundred men to the front to be discipled and now we have them in groups and uh, one of my guys called today and he's leading one of those groups tonight they're starting on materials that we published a long time ago. And, and so I'm very anxious about these guys because I live in them. And that's the way, that's the only mandate Jesus gave us. And here it is, biggest life here. So in the first three verses, the first five verses, he uses the word glory three times. Now look at the last one. I didn't mention the last one. This one concerns the past. This one is prospective. This looks forward to the future. Look at verse uh, 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So now he projects forward into his return home. Now, you can give me the biggest idea here. You'll never learn anything greater than this about Jesus, but it'll be hidden. <laughs> Two verbs. In verse 1, glorify. And in verse 5, glorify. Now, latch on to this. Those are imperative mood verbs. Tell me what that means. What do you mean? 
Jesus is commanding his father. <laughs> see, that's the reason this is. See, there was never any disagreement inside of God between Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. There was never any out of sort will. Although Jesus and the Father had two wills, he said, not my will, but thine be done. There are two wills involved there. But there was never, never, never any disagreement between them as to will. And, and he commands the Father. I doubt that at all it was necessary. I think this is all on display. Who heard him pray this prayer? We did, essentially. But they did, but we did. How? Well, why? I mean, I think he may have prayed it on the move. Right in the middle of it. Because they're in transition. And I'm, I'm confident they all heard it. That's exceptional, apparently, for the prayers of Jesus. They usually didn't hear them. That is, the lengthy prayers, apparently. But this one, they heard it very, very vividly. In other words, this is for our learning. <clears throat> it's only once recorded at any length. There are some that have, they have synopsis statements of them and then occasionally actually the prayer itself but no length and then most times when he went out at length it simply says he went out and prayed whatever it's interesting they spoke asked for him to speak plainly and no parables yeah good as he was beginning to do it yeah well i'll tell you this <laughs> this would reward a lifetime of study john 17 alone it has one of the greatest Christologies in it. In other words, doctrine of the person of Christ you'll find anywhere. And there, there's much more needs to be said about the person of Christ that isn't said here because it wasn't intended to. But what is said here is an infinite Christology. I jotted down the margin by notes. And just write some of these down. The amazing revelations about Jesus that are contained in this prayer, mind you. In this prayer. And I, actually, the word prayer is not the best word. I don't know what to call it. Because it's not like we think of as prayer. The word is not used that we would use for prayer. Here are some of the things you learn about Jesus. You learn his pre existence. And you learn, secondly, that it was eternal, in other words, infinitely eternal pre existence. So you never can see to the end of it, looking back. You never can see a wall. It's infinite. Jesus is strange in this respect. He's the only person ever born in this world whose life did not begin when he was conceived. He was pre-Bethlehem. And that's almost an understatement. He was eternally pre-Bethlehem. Always coexistent. He indicates that here. Always co-essential. He commands God. Always co-eternal. I don't know. You'd have to say always if you say eternal. And he's co-equal. In other words, there are no lessers or greaters here. His position of subordinates is a, is a voluntary position. Of subordination, in other words, submission to the Father as the Son. Now we'll come back to that later, God willing. Here's another big thing about Him: He and the Father shared a glory of being. He and the Father shared a glory of being without division in the equal and eternal Godhead. He and, the floor, he and the Father shared a glory of being without division. Those are carefully weighed words. In the equal and eternal Godhead. And there is an incredible commentary here, number four, on the Trinity. I'm finishing writing at home, printing out at home a message on the Trinity. Uh, to me, the biggest one is the final. I'll just give you one more. There are others here, but this is enough. 
here Jesus is, and, and I'll use the loose word, Jesus is appealing or asking or commanding, whatever word we're going to use. In other words, it's guaranteed, but he's still appealing. Jesus is appealing that the very glory he had with the Father before the world was be restored to him but with an additional dimension. <laughs> what was it? He included the Son. No, that's good. <laughs> Which one is he appealing for? He's talking about himself. Mm -hmm. So what's the additional dimension? He goes back to heaven as what? Right before he was. Now what does he go back to heaven as now? It wasn't before. Savior. Man. He took his humanity. In other words, he is now asking God to glorify him, including his humanity, for he's praying here as the Son of Man. So, what's the takeoff from that? It means that true humanity, like yours, like mine, but without sin, unlike mine, has been glorified with the very glory of God. What many Christians do not realize is that Jesus is in heaven tonight as a man. So this is one of the incidental guarantees that when I've been saved, I am saved forever because my humanity in a representative person is already received by God and installed in His glory in heaven. And I, being in Christ, cannot get out of it any more than He can. <laughs> is this me? And all of that is in this prayer. It's really the Lord's prayer. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. It's the only thing that deserves to be called the Lord's prayer. The other one is, is a model, and, and for us, it stands only as an ideal model. It's very difficult even to pray it. I, I came across a, a theological statement. Just listen to it and wrap your mind around it and see what you come out with. This prayer reveals in the loftiest and sublimest form the divine humanity of the Son of Man. Now, how do you tell it that it's divine? Because He's commanding God. How do you tell it's human? Because He prays. The divine humanity of the Son of Man and the fact and the consciousness of Jesus as the Christ of God, there was actually blended the union of the divine and human and a perfect exercise of the prerogatives of both. This passage surpasses all literature in its setting forth the identity of being and power and love in the twofold personality of the God man. And this is only beginning. Next time, God willing, we'll get into the things he, he prays for, for us. There are several categories of things, big categories, that he spreads over history, praying first for his immediate 11, and then for all future disciples, including us. And he's serious about it. Big, big, big. We'll, we'll stop there. That's enough to cover in one session. Too much to cover in one session. <laughs> How can anybody say that much in 23 sentences? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Well, well and then the, the idiot who says this book is just a compilation. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't read it. They're not reading it or not understanding yeah, it. They're just listening to a different voice. <laughs> well, but how in the world could anyone read that? And, I mean, what kind of genius? My question is, if that's a compilation of men, why don't we produce another one? Mm -hmm. That's like saying Jesus is a, I mean. I don't you, think somebody could take and know all this book and be able to write a book as sophisticated absolutely as Absolutely cannot do it. And, and, no and, and including exactly, I mean, not only the words, but the placement of the words, the use, the of, use the words, of the words, yeah. the connection of the words, the ideas in the words. Uh, I mean, God's like we are. He's bound to word communication because we're word communicating people. And 
And, and when you put this book in front of it, open any page, and, and a man stands there and tells me this is just another book, you're right. He's not reading with the same mind I'm reading. Well, that's not another book that changes your mind. Absolutely. Yeah. But most of most people gloss over the words. They, they look at the words, but they have no understanding. Of the ideas or the concepts. Greek, Hebrew, tenses, and Greek words yes. that we're talking. I always go back and to, to for years and years. I, I mean, I did this but this is the reason. You remember the eunuch going along on his chariot, and Philip was whisked away, and joined himself ran alongside the chariot and got up on the seat. And what was his first question? He was reading the passage easiest to understand in the entire Old Testament about the atonement of Jesus. But what was Philip's question? Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? Mm -hmm. And he said. This is one sharp man. He's the exchequer of Ethiopia. <laughs> and, and he said, how can I unless somebody teach me? Well, that's what a teacher's for. And it's catalytically incarnational and incarnationally catalytic. A teacher is there not just to teach people. He's there to teach them how to teach themselves. How long did it take him to teach him? I mean, I know he don't say that, but he says he goes on, you know. Well, it's, get this, it says beginning at the same text, he opened his mouth, and the word is evangelized, which means good news. He good newsed Jesus to him. Because the text was obviously about Jesus. Because he evangelized, so he just told him about Jesus. That's how right. he fulfilled that prophecy. Now that guy said, Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, well, you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, well, I do. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, here's Philip. He's leading a, a gigantic crusade in Samaria, and it says there's joy that filled the city. So he's having incredible. I hear the evangelist lives for this. And God says, get out of here. Right, can you imagine what he said? Where? You mean there's going to be something better than this? Mm hmm yeah, but you know, you're not going to think so when you see him. It's a black-faced guy on a chariot headed for Africa. <laughs> see, but God had a continent on his mind. Philip only saw numbers of people. See, when the Holy Spirit is your chairman of evangelism, you can trust him. He's rigging something for a big-time future if you obey him. And if you go by your ideas, you'll stay and keep leading those people to pad your reputation and your record. But if you follow him, you look up a thousand years later and the continent of Africa will have Christians everywhere. So, is that all he needed to do was just evangelize, teach that guy how to evangelize? That's all he could do probably at the time he was given. He, he, actually, it was, it was, he saw how to evangelize in what was done to him. Mm -hmm. and it's very, actually, evangelism is very simple. It's get full of the news and tell somebody. So, sooner or later, them guys got disciples. They learned more about it. Somebody came to them. I, I don't, I would guess, yeah, I would guess the Holy Spirit, having been triggered by an individual incarnational man, the Holy Spirit attended that guy. I mean, just think of who we're talking about. Now, what, what were, where was that guy going and where had he been? He'd been to Jerusalem as a proselyte worshiper, a guy that will spend that much money at that much risk making that long a trip is very eager about God and God won't let him get away. But he didn't find the answer in the rituals of Judaism at the Passover feast in Jerusalem. He wouldn't find the answer there. But God's still not going to let him get away, so he will whisk a guy out of a big crusade and get him down there to meet his name. Funny though, it all started with this, too. This guy's word. And and he, I mean, he the knew that this was a lot. He bought him a Bible in Jerusalem, right. or somebody he gave it to him. And here he is reading one, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and he talked about rigged. And it's all about the cross and all and about And he was Jesus. thinking, what on earth could this mean? <laughs> and I'm sure, I mean, what else would you say? Well, how else can I know if somebody doesn't teach me what this means? There's no way I'll know what it means. Well, the book of Acts, I'm, I'm restudying it recently, and, and everything, in, everything triggers me. And I'm in the, the 8th through the 12th chapters up, leading up to the church in Antioch, and Paul being sent out to the church in Antioch. Wow. I'm, I'm going to have to teach you on that in our retreat because our theme is evangelism. And somebody's going to have to move off and let me have a place. <laughs> uh, 
Anybody got a question or a comment? Remember, teaching is not learning. Teaching <laughs> stimulates learning, but now comes the learning. Have a look at it for yourself. I'm, I'm going to I'm going back over it again. I, I, you know, I've, I've got Marcus Rainsford's big book. It's that thick on John 17. I've never read it. I'm anxious to get into it. Not learning. Right. Teaching only starts the process, but the learner is the one who has to determine what happens next. Well, the book of John is just tremendous. I've even studied to my house for, since, since last April. Monday it's months. limitless. It is totally, it is totally limitless. Yeah. If I were a pastor today, I think I'd want to be in the Gospel of John. I mean, the, like the Islamic controversy. If you want to see what God honors, see what they hate. They hate the cross. They've said the gospel of John cannot be authentic. Well, then I want to preach it. Who said that? I'm sorry. Muslims. They say it cannot be authentic because it disagrees with the Quran. Jesus is not the Son of God. God has no Son. That's right. They actually, I deal with a lot of Muslims. I had one leave a paper that's 15 pages long on a table yesterday. And I flipped it over and saw what it was, and I said, what in the heck is this? Because what really stood out on the page was in the second paragraph that said, Christianity is the white man's religion. Oh, yeah, they're teaching this all over like, the colored what? part of the world. Mm -hmm. Teach so, it to black people here in America. I started looking at it, and I didn't read the whole thing. I kind of skimmed through some of it. And it's, they, they attacked the book of John and said, there's no evidence that John ever knew Jesus. And they had... People listed uh, names and one titles. wonders what uh, what evidence they're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took them 15 pages to to say that this is full of lies. It's been rewritten. It's not true. But what they've got is the truth, and that Jesus was Muslim. Oh yeah, Jesus. Like, what? Adam was Muslim. See, they say now it goes all the way back. It mm -hmm. didn't start with Muhammad. Mm -hmm. He only, he only restored what God had already, what Allah had already done from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing is so shot full of inconsistencies, historical inaccuracies. It, it is unbelievable. One of the things that we all were laughing about was this Muslim paper said, ask the Vatican about their $6,000 secret. Now, the one, one that taught them, well, the $6,000 secret was that Vatican knew since about the third century where the body of Christ was. It was in a, a glass tube with chemicals only known to the ancient Egyptians. And then there were four mirrors placed around it so that it reflected the image of Christ. And for $6,000, the Vatican would let you go down there and look. But you wouldn't know if you were seeing real Christ or a reflection of him. Now, think carefully what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Fyodor Dostoyevsky said, when a man rejects God, it's not amazing what he doesn't believe, it's amazing what he will. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Well, I, I didn't, but, but see, I would want that guy sitting across from me. <coughs> so, would, you, would, you, would you like to, are you just uh, scatter gun shooting, or are you interested in talking about this? If you're interested in talking about it, I'd be happy to meet you. See, wait, we were down, we went to see a fellow this past week that's on his deathbed, according to the like, to see if he was saved or not. I visited with him a little while. And he said he was saved when he was 12, baptized and all that. Before we left, he said, you know, there's only going to be 144,000 in heaven. The rest of us are going to be on the second earth. That could be Joe. That's Joe. That's Joe. That's Joe. Yeah. But you know, I think right there spreading <coughs> all this false stuff. And people listen to it. Well, but man's nature is inclined toward that. But, yeah. but we have the advantage. We don't, we're never at a disadvantage when we talk about personal life because the Holy Spirit can quicken that person into life. Here's the thing. But they're out evangelizing us. Well, if, if, see, the key is to share the truth with them. Yeah. And it doesn't, right. like you, it doesn't have to be much truth. I mean, he, how much did that guy on the chariot hear? But God had triggered him. And uh, I've seen 
I've seen a, a sentence that didn't, it only had a modicum of truth in it, revolutionized yeah. a person's life. I was revolutionized that way. <laughs> sentence that would take 10 seconds to say maximum. And my life was absolutely revolutionized by it. And later on, the guy said it to me, didn't even remember saying it. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> but I, I, I was a 17 year old, and I was down at the swimming pool in Fayetteville where I was raised, a hot July day. I was full of hell. I mean, absolutely oozing the devil. And and I took God's name. There were kids everywhere. Just you could hardly move through them. It was, it was hot, hot day, and they were down there swimming. And I thought I said something real loud that I thought was real clever. And I laughed. I took God's name in vain, coupled it with a damn. And and found a corridor between them and went out and laughed loudly one night after I said that and hit the water. Went out as far as I could go and came up and came swimming back in. Was a guy down the curb of the pool about eight or ten feet. And I don't know how much I knew about him. I think I knew his first name and that's all. His name was Bob Biney. And he was a, a first generation, second generation removed German. In other words, his grandparents, his grandmother had come over with them. His daddy and mother still spoke of their W's were B's and B's were W's. And he moved down the side of the pool. And when I started to get back out of the water, he just reached his right hand down. I grabbed like that. I thought he was just helping me out of the water and he pulled me up. I was dripping wet. But he didn't let go of my hand. He pulled it right up to, to his chest held it right here. Well, I put my face right here. And I'm just wiping the water out of my face, out of my eyes. And I looked up to see why I was trying to pull my hand away. And he's just holding it right here. This boy was a year younger than I. He was 16. And whenever I got my eyes open enough to look into his face, he said, looked right into my eyes and very gently said, Herb, do you know you just damned the only person who ever loved you enough to die for you? That's all he said. Well, I acted like anybody in the lost guy would do. I thought it acted like it was a joke. Jerked my hand away, found the corridor real quickly, dived into the water. And for nine months, I carried that like a sledgehammer in me. I couldn't get rid of it. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that I was guilty. And I knew I needed whatever he, he was suggesting, but I didn't know what to do and didn't know what it meant. And then on my 18th birthday, a man told me how to be saved. And I was saved, I mean, in the instant, he could hardly get the words out of his mouth. When he told me how to be saved, I was as gloriously saved as a human being. I was Pauline saved. I was saved by the ambush. <laughs> and and it's, it's awfully easy for me to think that's the only kind of conversion it is, but that's ridiculous. And there, are other, there, are, there are qualities, there are depths of conversion psychologically depending on the nature of your person. If you're very contemplative, you're likely to have a contemplative conversion. The 16th chapter of Acts models three of them, and they're very vividly different. And then the first prayer meeting I went to officially was nine months later in Bob Bainey's home. And there was a gang of us high school seniors there. And I pulled him down a dark hallway. His parents had left home to let us have it. I pulled him down a dark hallway and just pushed him up against the wall, with the shoulders. And I said, do you remember? And I restructured that. He did not even remember saying it. Yeah. The Lord just. I mean, <laughs> it's just like he penetrated with an arrow or a, a dart or a bullet. It and, his words. and the guy didn't even, that's right. Yeah. He didn't even remember it saying it. And he and I today, he calls me about every three months, and here's what we always say when we call each other. He says, Herb, this is Bob. Are you being available? <laughs> and there's silence on the line. And I often say something like this, well, probably not as much as I should be. And he said, well, it's only 8.15. <laughs> you talk about a friend. He's godly. He's, he's the greatest lay soul in her. And, and uh, we are steadfast friends. I can hardly wait to get to heaven and talk over all this. <laughs> I'm sure we won't look at each other for a million years, but the second million, it's going to be good. <laughs> uh, but I love him with my heart. And he, he doesn't even remember that, so 
whenever I tell that story and I send him the tape, he, 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 won't. he said, no, because he doesn't even remember it. <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> yeah. I see he's got one of those little black Bibles like I've got sitting on top. Yeah, yep. I carry carry one of those too that Dad gave me, and it's really interesting because I've challenged a couple of the Muslims with that, and uh, and I ask them a question and they'd answer it, and I'd say, "Well, if you were wrong, would you want to know it?" Yeah, and I'd turn and walk off. <laughs> they could so, walk after me. Yeah. What do you mean? I I, I thought you were going to elaborate on that. And I said, well, yeah, I will. And I said, would you just read something from me? Yeah. And I have done it, I know, to two Muslims. And I, I actually had another guy that was a Christian that I got his attention. I said, watch this. And he did that. And by the time they read the third scripture, both of these men that knew, didn't know each other, one was in the one institution and one was in the other institution, did exactly the same thing. And it just amazed me. <laughs> I was like, how could, they don't know each other. This is impossible. Except that it, it's the Holy Spirit caused it. Yeah. But they both did the same thing. I see what you're trying to do. I see what you're trying to do. Well, that's no, no, exactly no, I see response. what you're trying to they do. They normally touch it. And I'm like, yeah. what did I try to do? I just asked you to read. Yeah. Now, I, I see what you're trying to do. Well, I'll hear I what I'll say at that point. Stuff. I'd say, well, in case you really wondered what I'm trying to do, let me tell you how it happened to me. And then see if you might be interested in this. Have you ever had your sins forgiven? Now, answer me honestly. No, you haven't. Because you cannot in religion get your sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Therefore, so I'm way ahead of you. Think I'm going to trade in my religion for yours? <laughs> the door is open to come the other direction. It's, it's. I, I've just, I've just been amazed by it. Just, I, I, I couldn't imagine the responses, and they, and I, I even drew another guy's attention that's an inmate, that's a Christian, and and he later said, well, why do you want me to see that? And I said, because this is the second guy who's done exactly the same thing. <laughs> He's like, what is that that you've got? And I had to place. share it with him then. Yeah. Well, we need to pray for you if you're if you're with Muslims regularly. God will give you wisdom and we may be the only witness in federal employee. Yeah. That's fine. I'm it takes one. I've gotten in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably only one beside the pool that day too. <laughs> That's right. I didn't recognize any others and he didn't recognize himself later. <laughs> Let's grab hands and pray.